the ninth flash. Everyone should not read this flash, for they will not see the subtle errors of the unity of existence and are not in need of it. In his name, and there is nothing but it glorifies him with praise. My dear, loyal, sincere, conscientious brother. The reason I did not write a separate letter to my brother, Abdul Majid, was that I considered the letters I had written to you to be sufficient. Footnote number one. Abdul Majid, Abd al-Majid, was Baduzman's younger brother, a teacher of the religious sciences, then a mufti. He translated parts of the Risale Nur into Arabic and Ishrat al-Ijiz and Mesnuvi in Nuria from Arabic into Turkish. He died in 1967. After Hulusi, Abdul Majid is a valuable brother for me and a student. Every morning and evening he is present in name, in my prayers, together with Hulusi, sometimes being mentioned first. First Sabri, then Hakka Effendi, profit from the letters I write you. Footnotes 3 and 4. Sabri R7, known as Santral Sabri, was one of Biruzman's most important students in Bala and was also Imam of the neighbouring village of Bedre. He died in 1954. Hakka Tuli, he was from Eridir and was imprisoned together with Biruzman in Eskishir in 1935. He acted as Biruzman's lawyer. I do not write separate letters either. Almighty Allah made you a blessed elder brother to them. You correspond with Abdul Majin in my place. He should not worry. After Hulusi, I think of him. Your first question. You ask a confidential question about one of your forefathers signing himself, Al Sayyid Muhammad. My brother, it is not possible for me to give a scholarly answer to this or to research into it. However, I told my companions, Hulusit resembles neither the present-day Turks nor the Kurds. I see other qualities in him. They agreed with this. We said in accordance with the saying, divine grace does not make ability a condition. The nobility to be observed in Hulusi is a divine gift. You should also know definitely that Allah's noble messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, has two families. One are his descendants and the other is his family in respect of the luminous collective personality of his prophethood. In addition to your certainly being included in this second family, I have an un unsubstantiated conviction that in respect of his first family, your forefather's signature was not without reason. My dear brother, a summary of your second question. Muyuddin al-Arabi said, the createdness of the spirit consists of its unfolding. Footnote 5. Mu'i al-Din ibn al-Arabi, an eminent scholar and thinker who profoundly influenced the development of Sufism. He was born in Andalusa in 560 H and died in Damascus in 638 H. Among his best known works are Fushus al-Hikam and al-Futhat al makiya With this question, you are compelling a powerless wretch like me to contest an awesome, brilliant scholar of reality and genius of the occult sciences like Mohirdin al-Arabi. However, relying on the teachings of the Quran, I can attempt the discussion. Even if I am only a fly, I can fly higher than such an eagle. My brother, you should understand that Hadrat Mohirdin would not deceive, but he could be deceived. He is rightly guided but may not be the guide in all his works. What he saw was correct, but it was not reality. The reality of man's spirit, the subject of your question, is elucidated in the 29th word, the discussion about the spirit. Yes, in respect of its nature, the spirit is a law proceeding from the divine command, but it is a living law clothed in external existence and possessing external existence. Hadrat Muyuddin, thought of it only from the point of view of its essential nature. The way of the unity of existence considers the existence of things to be imagination. Together with his wondrous illuminations and observations, since he had chosen an important and independent way, he was compelled to apply certain Quranic verses to his way and observations, artificially and with forced interpretations, thus marring the clarity of the verses. 
In others of his treatises, he expounds the straight highway of the Quran and the Sunnis. The Holy One holds a position of his own, and he is among those who are acceptable. But he exceeded the limits in his unbalanced illuminations, and in many matters opposed the majority of the learned authorities. It is because of this that all, although he was such an elevated and wondrous spiritual pole, unequalled down the ages, it is as though his particular way was very short and restricted to Sadruddin al Qunawi, and that his works are only rarely benefited from by those on the straight path. Footnote number six. Sadr al Din al Qunawi, one of Ibn al Arabi's foremost students. He wrote a number of works on Sufism, among which is Al Nishus fi Takik al Tor al Makushus. Some of the authoritative scholars do not show any inclination to study those valuable works, and some of them even prevent it. Lengthy study and a very elevated and broad view is needed to show the fundamental differences together with their sources. Between Hadrat Muhyiddin's way and that of accepting exacting scholars. Yes, the differences are so fine and profound, and the sources so elevated and extensive, that Hadrat Muyuddin has not been censured and has continued to be accepted. For if in regard to thought, scholarship and illumination, the difference and sources had become apparent, it would have been an extremely serious fall for him and grievous error. Since the difference is so profound, we shall try to show it and the sources briefly by means of a comparison and Hadrat Muyuddin's errors in the matter. For example, the sun appears in a mirror. The mirror both contains the sun and is qualified by it. That is to say, in one respect, the sun is present in the mirror and in another respect, it adorns the mirror, becoming a brilliant colour, attribute and quality of it. If the mirror had been a camera, it would have fixed the sun's image on photographic paper. In these cases, the sun appearing in the mirror and its semblance on the photographic paper and its aspect that adorns the mirror and becomes like a quality of the mirror are other than the actual sun. They are not the sun, but the sun's manifestation which has taken on another existence. As for the existence of the sun, which is very visible in the mirror, even if it is not identical with the sun, which is visible outside. Since it is tied to it and points to it, it is supposed to have the same existence. In consequence of this comparison, it may be said that there is nothing apart from the actual sun in the mirror, meaning that the mirror contains it and intending the sun's external existence in the mirror. But if it is said the sun's extended reflection, which has become like an attribute or quality of the mirror, and its image, which has been transposed to the photographic paper, is the sun, it is wrong. It is an error to say there is nothing in them other than the sun, for there, there is the reflection on the mirror's shining face and the image formed on its back, and these have their own separate existences. For sure, those existences are from the sun's manifestation, but they are not the sun. Man's mind and imagination resemble this of the mirror, it is as follows. The information in the mirror of man's thought also has two faces. In one respect, it is knowledge. In another, it is known. If we suppose the mind to contain what is known, then the known thing becomes something known by the mind. Its existence is something different to the mind. If we suppose the mind to be qualified by the thing, it becomes an attribute or quality of the mind. Then the thing becomes knowledge and has an external existence. Even if the existence of the thing known is essential, johari, it is an accidental external existence like knowledge. Thus, according to these two comparisons, the universe is a mirror. The true nature of beings is also a mirror. They are subject to divine creation through the pre-eternal power. In one respect, each being is sort of mirror to one of the names of the pre-eternal sun, displaying one of its embroideries. Those on the way of Hadrat Muyuddin unveiled them only in respect of being mirrors and containers. 
revealing the similitude of their existence in the mirror. From the point of view of denial, and supposing the reflection to be identical with the thing reflected, did not think of other levels. They said, there is no existent but he, and were in error. They almost went as far as denying the fundamental rule, the reality of beings is constant. As for the people of reality, they have seen through the mystery, the legacy of prophethood, and the definite statements of the Quran that the embroideries and inscriptions that come into being in the mirrors of beings through divine power and will are his works. They are all from him. They are not all him. Footnote number seven. That is, everything is from him. He creates it. Not everything is him, so that it may be said, there is no existent save him. Things have an existence, and their existence is constant to a degree. For sure, it is weak compared to that of the necessary existence, like an illusion or imagining. But through the pre-eternal, all-powerful one's creation, will and power, it exists. In the comparison, the sun in the mirror has an existence through its similitude apart from its external existence, and its expanded reflection also, which gives colour to and adorns the mirror, has an accidental and separate external existence. And the sun's image, which is depicted on photographic paper on the back of the mirror, also has a separate and accidental external existence. Similarly, the inscriptions of beings, which appear through the manifestations of the sacred divine names, occurring through will, choice and power, in the mirror of the universe and mirrors of the quintessential nature of things, have created existence separate from the necessary existence. And this existence has been given permanence through pre-eternal power. But if the connection were severed, all things would at once cease to be. For their continued existence, all things are every instant in need of their creators preserving them. The reality of things is constant, but it is constant and permanent only through his making it so. Thus Hadrat Muyadin saying that spirit is not created, it is a reality proceeding from the world of divine command and from the attribute of will, is contrary to many clear statements of the Quran and Hadiths, and according to the investigation of the above, he was confused, deceived, and had not seen the weak existences of things. The places of manifestation of divine names like creator, provider, cannot be illusions or imaginary. Since the names have a reality, their places of manifestation also have an external reality. Your third question. You want instruction in the science of Jafir, which will form a key to it. The answer. We are not carrying out this work and service at our own wish and through our own planning. A better will than ours governs in this work over and above our wills. The science of Jaffa is an absorbing and pleasurable occupation, hence busying us and detaining us from our true, true duties. On many occasions even, certain mysteries of the Quran were being revealed through that key. But when I addressed myself to them with complete enthusiasm and enjoyment, they eluded me. I discovered two instances of wisdom in this. The first it is possible that it is discourteous towards the prohibition expressed by none knows the unseen save Allah. The second, the service of teaching the Islamic community about the fundamental truths of belief and the certain proofs of the Quran has a value and merit far exceeding occult science such as Jafir. The firm evidences and categorical proofs employed in that sacred duty allow no opportunity for exploitation. But in the occult sciences like Jafir, which are not tied to any firm rules, there is the possibility of abuse and charlatans taking advantage of them. In fact, whenever need for service of reality arises, a little is bestowed according to need. Among the keys of Jafir, the easiest and perhaps the purest and finest are the various sorts of co coincidences which proceed from the divine name of originator, have been manifested in the name of Allah, in the Quran, and adorn the works we have published. They have been pointed out to a small extent 
in several places in the work Keramet i Gavsia, the wonders of Al Golf Al Azam. For instance, if the coincidences show something in several aspects, it is a sign that has strength of a proof. Sometimes, with a number of deductions, a single coincidence may constitute a proof. However, that is enough for now. If there is serious need, it will be made known to you. Your fourth question. That is not your question. Imam Irma Effendi's, which concerned a wretched doctor saying that Jesus, peace be upon him, was born of a father. Footnote number eight. The extraordinary achievements of an extraordinary human individual who is the leader of a quarter of mankind transformed humankind into angels of a sort and left this world to make the heavens his dwelling. These extraordinary achievements of his demand an extraordinary form of the law of reproduction. For his being included under that law in a dubious, unknown, unnatural and even base way would in no way have been appropriate for him. Nor was there any necessity for him to be included under it. Moreover, the explicit statements of the Quran do not sustain interpretation. How can the law of angel sexuality, which is outside reproduction, and in no way can be broken for the sake of repairing the law of human reproduction, which has been broken in a hundred ways, how can this law, together with powerful laws like the law of explicit verses of the Quran, be violated? With a lunatic interpretation, the doctor tried to show that a Quranic verse justifies him in saying this. At one time, the unfortunate man was trying to create something with the disjointed letters. He was working feverishly at this. Then I understood that he had perceived from the atheist's attitude that they were going to attempt to abolish the Islamic script. The man was working pointlessly, as though he was going to save the script in the face of that flood. Now in this matter, and in the second matter, he realised the atheists' terrible attacks against the fundamentals of Islam, and I reckon that he wanted to find a way of compromising through meaningless interpretations like that. According to definite verses like, The similitude of Jesus before Allah is that of Adam. Quran, Surah 3, verse 59. Jesus, peace be upon him, had no father. No importance should therefore be given to what those who attempt to change such a firm and authentic truth through idiotic, forced interpretations, because they suppose there to be impossible contravention of the law of human reproduction. For there is no law at all that has no exceptions and to which individuals have not been subject, and there is no universal law that has not been breached by extraordinary individuals. Since the time of Adam, there has been no law to which there have been no individual exceptions. Firstly, the law of reproduction was violated in regard to the origins, by the origins, of the 200,000 animal species and brought to an end, that is, the 200,000 progen progenitors of the species, quite simply like Adam's, violated the law of reproduction. They were not born of a father and mother, and they were given existence outside the law. Furthermore, the greater part, innumerable individuals, of the hundred thousand species we see with our eyes every spring, are created outside that law, on the surface of leaves and on putrefied matter. So you can see just how unreasonable is someone who cannot accept with his reason the exception of a single individual in 1,900 years to a law that was violated, breached at its origin and has been breached every year even and cling to forced interpretations of the definite statements of the Quran. The things those wretches call natural laws are the laws called Adat Allah or divine practices which are a universal manifestation of the divine command and dominical will and which Almighty Allah changes for certain instances of wisdom. He shows his will and choice of govern in everything and in every law. Certain extraordinary individuals breach those practices. This truth he points out through his decree. The similitude of Jesus before Allah is that of Adam.
Omar Effendi's second question concerning the doctor. The doctor behaves extremely foolishly in this matter, so that to listen to what he says or give it importance is very demeaning. The unfortunate wants to be halfway between belief and unbelief. I say the following in reply not to his unimportant discussion, but to Omar Effendi's questioning. The reason for the injunctions and prohibitions of the Sharia are the divine command and divine prohibition. Advantages and instances of wisdom are to give them weight and may not be the reason for the command or prohibition from the point of view of the divine name of all wise. For example, someone making a journey shortens the five daily prayers. There is a reason for and a purpose or instance of wisdom in shortening them. The reason is the journey while the purpose is a difficulty involved. If on a journey, and there is no difficulty involved, the prayers are still shortened. If not on a journey, and the person suffers a hundred difficulties in his own house, he may not shorten the prayers. For the difficulty occurring on some journeys is sufficient as the purpose for shortening the prayers, and is again sufficient for making the journey the reason. Thus in accordance with this rule of the Sharia, the Sharia's injunctions do not change in consequence of purposes or instances of wisdom. They look to the true reasons. Apart from the harm and illness caused by pork, as the doctor said, according to the saying, one who eats pork becomes like a pig in some respects. The pig is not harmless, like other domestic animals. Footnote number 10. I wonder, does the fact that, despite all the wondrous progress and civilization and civilization of Europe and its advances in science and knowledge beneficial for humanity. Its people eat pork and not play some part in their becoming piggishly stuck in the darkness of materialism and naturalism, which are entirely the reverse of that progress, knowledge and attainment, I ask you. Evidence that man's temperament is affected by the food he eats is the saying, one who eats meat every day for 40 days will suffer anxiety and sorrow in his heart, which has become proverbial. In addition to its meat causing considerable harm rather than being beneficial, it has been established medically that the powerful fat in its meat is also harmful. Even in the lands of Europe, which are powerfully cold, and thus in fact, and in meaning, extremely harmful. Thus, instances of wisdom like these are a purpose for the divine prohibition and for its being forbidden. It is not necessary for the wisdom to be present in every instance and all the time. The reason does not change with the purpose and wisdom changing. If the reason does not change, the injunction does not change. And so it may be seen through this rule how far from the spirit of the Sharia the unfortunate man was when he spoke. No importance should be given to what he said regarding the Sharia. The Creator has many animals in the form of unreasoning philosophers. An addendum to the answer to your question about Muhyiddin al-Arabi. Question. Muhyiddin al-Arabi considered the unity of existence to be the highest level. Likewise, some of the great saints who took the path of love followed him. However, you say that in this matter it is not the highest level and is not real. That is, rather the way to a degree of those who become intoxicated and immersed in the divine, and of the people of love and ecstasy. So what briefly is the high level of affirmation of divine unity pointed out by the clear verses of the Quran, through the mystery of the legacy of prophethood? Can you explain it? The answer. It is a hundred times beyond the ability of an utterly powerless, unfortunate myself to judge these elevated stations with his limited thought. I shall just explain one or two extremely brief points proceeding from the effulgence of the all-wise Quran. Perhaps they will be useful in understanding the matter. The first point. There are numerous reasons for the way of the unity of existence and for becoming enmeshed in it. One or two of them shall be described. The first reason. Because they could not squeeze into their brains the maximum degree of the creativity of dominicality and could not entirely establish in their hearts that everything, through the mystery of divine oneness, is held directly 
in the grasp of dominicality, and that all things have existence through divine power, choice and will. Those who took that way were obliged to say that everything is either him, or does not have existence, or is imaginary, or is his manifestation or emanation. The second reason, the mark of a passionate love, is to want never to be separated from the beloved and to flee desperately from such separation, to tremble at the thought of parting, to fear distance from the beloved as though fearing hell, and to abominate transience, to love union with the love of one's own spirit and life, and to yearn for closeness to the beloved with the longing for paradise. Thus, through adhering to a manifestation of divine immediacy in all things, those who took the way of unity of existence disregarded separation and distance. Supposing union and meeting to be permanent, they said, There is no existent but he. Through the intoxication of love, and as demanded by the ecstasy of permanence, meeting and union, they imagined that in the unity of existence was a most pleasurable way of illumination, whereby they could be saved from the dreadfulness of separation. That is to say, the source of the first reason was the inability of the hand of the intellect to reach up to some of the truths of belief, which were entirely broad and elevated. It's being unable to comprehend them and not having developed completely in regard to belief, while the source of the second reason was the extraordinary unfolding of the heart from the point of view of love and its wondrous expansion and breadth. However, the supreme level of divine unity, which the purified ones, who were the people of sobriety and great saints of the legacy of prophethood, saw through the explicit expositions of the Quran, is both extremely elevated and shows both the maximum level of dominicality and creativity, and that all the divine names are real. It preserves its bases and does not spoil the balance of the degrees of dominicality. For they say that together with the oneness of his essence and his being free of space, with his knowledge, Almighty Allah encompasses and determines directly all things with all their attributes, and through his will he chooses and specifies them, and through his power he creates them. He creates and directs the whole universe as though it were a single being. He creates the huge spring with the same ease as creating a flower. Nothing can be an obstacle to anything else. There is no fragmentation in his rearranging things. He is present everywhere at the same instant through the disposal of his knowledge and power. There is no division or distribution in his disposal. This mystery has been expounded and proved completely in the 16th word and in the second stopping place of the 32nd word. Since, according to the rule, comparisons are incontestable, attention is not paid to to the defects in comparison and allegory. I shall set forth a very faulty comparison so that differences between the two ways may be understood to a degree. For example, let us imagine a huge, matchless and wondrously adorned peacock which can fly from east to west in an instant and opens and closes its wings which stretch from north to south are adorned with hundreds of thousands of fine patterns and in every single feather of which are included brilliant arts. Now, there are two men observing it. They want to fly with the wings of the intellect and heart up to the elevated qualities of the bird, to its wondrous decorations. One looks at the peacock's condition and form and the marvellous inscriptions of power on, its, on all its feathers. He loves it with extreme passion and ardour, he in part abandons his attentive, reflective thought and adheres, and adheres to love. But then he sees that every day those lovable decorations change and are transformed. Those objects of his love, which he worships, disappear and are lost. While he should have said that through divine unity, which he could not encompass with his mind, an absolute dominicality and the oneness of the divine essence... They were the artistic decorations of an inscriber possessing universal creativity. He, he said instead, 
in order to console himself that the spirit of the peacock was so sublime that its maker was within it, or that the peacock had become its maker, and that since its spirit had become one with its spirit, and its being had combined with its outward appearance, its spirit's perfection and being's exaltedness displayed those manifestations, showing a different inscription and beauty every moment. It was not a true creation through its will, but rather a manifestation and emanation. As for the other man, he said that those harmonious and well-ordered decorations, so full of art, necessitated will, choice, intention and purpose. It was not possible for there to be a manifestation without will, an emanation without choice. Yes, the peacock had a beautiful and elevated nature, but it could not be the doer. It was passive. It could not become one with the active agent. Its spirit was fine and exalted, but it could not be the creator and disposer, only receptive and a means. For observedly, in each of its feathers was an art performed with infinite wisdom and an inscription and decoration made through an infinite power. And these could not occur without will and choice. These arts showing perfect wisdom within perfect power and perfect dominicality and mercy within perfect wisdom were not the work of some sort of manifestation. The scribe who had written that gilded notebook could not be inside it and united with it. The notebook rather had only contact with the nib of the scribe's pen, in which case the wondrous decorations of the similitude of the peacock known as the universe were a gilded missive of the peacock's creator. Now, look at the peacock and read the missive. Say to its scribe, What wonders Allah has willed? Blessed be Allah, glory be to Allah. One who supposes the missive to be the scribe, or the scribe to be inside the letter, or fancies the missive to be imagination, has surely mislaid his reason in the veils of love and been unable to see the true form of reality. Among the varieties of passionate love, the one most giving rise to the way of the unity of existence is love of this world. When it turns into true love, love of this world, which is metaphorical, is transformed into the unity of existence. A person loves a personal beloved with metaphorical love, then unable to accept with his heart his beloved's transience and ephemerality, he consoles himself, saying that he is a mirror to the true object of love and worship, and attaches himself to a reality, so acquiring permanence for him through true love. In the same way, when the strange love of one who takes the huge world and universe in its totality as his beloved is transformed into true love through the constant blows of death and separation. He seeks refuge in the way of the unity of existence in order to save that great beloved of his from death and separation. If he has extremely strong and elevated belief, it becomes pleasurable, luminous, acceptable level, like with those resembling Muyuddin al-Arabi. However, there is the possibility of falling into abysses, embracing materiality and becoming submerged in causes. As for the unity of witnessing, it is harmless. It is an exalted way of the people of sobriety. O oh Allah, show us what is indeed the truth and make us follow it. Glory be unto you. We have no knowledge save that that which you have taught us. Indeed, you are 